1961, a time of rising Cold War tensions and a bold proclamation by President John F. Kennedy in the midst of a superpower space race. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Two kids who saw this space race up close and personal back in small town Ohio during the 60s, Ellen Stofan and her older sister, Lynn. My father was actually a rocket scientist. He was a rocket engineer that started out at NASA's uh, Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. I went to my first launch when I was four, and one of the reasons I remember is because it blew up on the launch pad. Still to this day, I can close my eyes and see it, but it was, it was very dramatic. To me, that, that's always exemplified. You push the boundaries, you're doing something that's hard, sometimes you fail, and you don't, you learn from failure rather than letting it stop you. Ellen Stofan, who grew up to become a pioneer in planetary geology, really just a fancy name for the study of space rock, spent her early days digging in the rich Midwestern soil. When I was sort of seven, eight years old, I used to read books. My hero at that point was Mary Leakey, and I thought, wow, that was my, my goal was to go to Africa and be an, an archeologist and study uh, human origins. Fast forward to 1969, when America did become the first nation to land a man on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. With a NASA dad and a mom who taught elementary school science, the study of science became, well, a family affair. When I was about 12 or 13, my mother took a geology course. She was getting her master's degree in education. And I went with her, trailed along behind the professor. He kindly answered a million questions that I had. And I thought, OK, this is it. What is more fascinating than the study of how the landscapes around us were formed? Then I went down to the Viking uh, missions to Mars launch, and I heard people like Carl Sagan talk about studying Mars, and I thought, wow, you can combine those into one field, and that's for me. And what followed? A degree in geology from the College of William and Mary, where Ellen met her future husband, Timothy Dunn, followed by a master's and a doctorate in planetary geology from Brown. This mother of three then blazed her own groundbreaking path with NASA and other space entities beginning in 1989. When I would go into a room and it would be full of guys um, and I'd be relatively young and a woman and with people knowing that my father worked for NASA, frankly, I felt like I had to work twice as hard to be taken half as seriously. And so I did. The result? Pioneering studies of Venus and Mars. And then there's Saturn's moon, Titan. Fifteen years ago, I started working on the Cassini mission. Um, and I, I started working on Titan, and it, you know, stole my heart. Here you are, you know, over 90 million miles away from the Earth, in this little moon of Saturn. And it has an atmosphere. It rains. It has seas with waves and currents and tides. Just think what that has to tell us about, about things in oceanography that we don't quite understand on Earth. In fact, Dr. Stofan proposed a daring approach to exploring Titan, sending a very high-tech sailboat to float on its gasoline-like seas and collect data. How romantic is that, sending something to sail on an alien sea? Um, and I had a great team, and we put together a proposal. In the end, it didn't get selected. But Titan is such a fascinating place. Undaunted, she forged ahead. And in 2013, NASA appointed Ellen Stofan as chief scientist. Her main goal today, continue with the space agency's 21st century equivalent to putting a man on the moon. The next step from the Apollo program is, is really pioneering Mars. How can we send humans to Mars by the mid-2030s? And a lot of people say, well, why not do it in five years? Landing on the surface through that very, very thin atmosphere on Mars, uh, what we call entry, descent, and landing, that's extremely technologically challenging, and we're not there yet. So how can we protect astronauts there? How do we feed people once they're on Mars? For example, we're going to definitely have to grow some of our food because you can't take all that food you need with you. Dr. Ellen Stofan has been bestowed with many honors, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. CNN even named her one of its extraordinary people of 2014. 
More than accolades, it's this fearless, inquisitive streak that has propelled Ellen Stofan, one of the world's experts on planetary geology, to such extraordinary heights, whether through bringing more women into science or striving to discover life beyond Earth by 2025. NASA's right on the brink of, of with the other space agencies of the world, of answering that fundamental question of are we alone. Our Kepler Space Telescope over the last several years has detected over a thousand planets around other stars, looking at only a small section of the night sky. Pretty soon our James Webb Space Telescope will look at the atmospheres of some of those planets. And through studying those atmospheres, we hope to say, can we identify potentially inhabited planets around other stars? That's gonna happen in like the next 10 years. How exciting is that?